All right, good morning. I am personally so happy that the election is over. And uh, I, uh, I find, I've always thought it was interesting that Paul wrote to Timothy at a time when the Roman powers were trying to kill off all the Christians and would eventually execute him because of his faith, that he wrote at an environment with such hatred toward Christians that Christians should pray for those who are in authority and pray that they would lead in such a way that we would live quiet and peaceable lives. And so for the last eight years, I've tried to do that every day for Barack and Michelle Obama and for Congress and Supreme Court and for the governor that sits in our state and for our mayor, Mayor Joins. And so last night, or actually I guess it was this morning, I discovered I'll now be doing that for Donald Trump. I would have certainly been doing that for Hillary Clinton. It is what we've been required to do. God wants us to pray for those who are in authority and to respect the positions that they hold and to pray that they would govern in such a way that, they, that we would be able to live quiet and peaceful lives and carry out God's work in maximum efficiency and effectiveness is, is my prayer. And so I'm glad it's over. I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. And uh, we're going to go forward, but let's do remember to continue to pray uh, from now to January 20th for our current president, Barack Obama and Michelle, and then for Donald Trump as he becomes president of the United States uh, on January 20th. All right, so I said back when Ben Rudolph was here speaking in chapel here a few weeks ago, uh, he's the pastor of the church at Denver, that we were going to reverse things this year. And so I am going to introduce today's speaker as the father of Ben Rudolph. That's about the only distinction we're going to recognize him for. Well, not really, but he is the father of Ben Rudolph, and I have known Ken Rudolph for years. I have profound appreciation for him. You know, we all have different things about speakers that we like and that we, 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 we like to hear certain people speak because they kind of connect with us. My favorite preacher on the planet is this guy. I would actually travel some distance to hear him, and I'm, I'm thrilled that he's here. Not only is he here today, but he's also agreed to uh, spend some lunch with you guys, anybody who's interested in preaching and, and that kind of a thing. He'd, he, he's going to share lunch with you today and actually get in a couple of Dr. White's classes before the day's over as well. Uh, he's had a, prof a profound impact on people through a lifetime. Uh, a while back, he worked in college administration at Baptist Bible College, now Clark Summit University. And, uh, but then he uh, got involved in not only in pastoral work, but also in something that he is uniquely gifted for, and that is communicating to young people. And he's done that so efficiently and effectively at Lake Ann, where he's held an executive position for years. But a few years ago, he really had a moment, a faith moment. We spent a lot of time around here talking about unleashed faith. And he decided that uh, even though he wasn't getting younger and younger and younger, he, he needed to branch out and go take it to the next level. And so he became a mobilizer for ABWE Mission Agency uh, in Europe, and he's having a huge impact across Europe for them. He's also connected to ACSI and the Christian school movement, and he speaks in Christian schools across Europe. And so he's had an impact, a huge and broad impact uh, across our world and across our movement. And we are honored today to have Ken Rudolph speaking in chapel. All right. It's great to be here with you again here at Piedmont University, International University. And uh, I know some of you may be cautiously optimistic about last night. Some of you are depressed. But that's okay because God is on the throne. Amen? Amen. So I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15, if you would. And uh, I believe God has led me to speak on this uh, passage. This is one of the, probably the, I, I'll put it this way, this was the greatest life message that God ever did in my life. And uh, I think I did this here at Piedmont maybe three or four years ago, and so all those people have graduated, so I can speak my favorite message again. And um, it's about depression. Um, now, I grew up on a dairy farm. Now, that's depressing enough right there, okay? You have to milk cows morning and night, and they never stop. The weekends, the cows don't say, all right, I won't give milk for a couple days so you can have a break. And, and uh, so I remember as a kid, I, I had to get up every morning, go out and feed the cows. I didn't milk the cows when I was little, but I had to feed the cows. And, uh, you know, I'd wake up and, and I'd just be, you know, and I grew up in western New York, okay, snow belt. So it's always cold there 
you know, except for a couple of days in the summer. And you'd get up and it's cold, and you're like, oh, I gotta go feed the cows, you know, and you'd go, you know, slog through the snow, and, and then I'd come in, I'm like, oh, now I gotta go to school. How many of you love school? You like school? About three of you, maybe? <laughs> All right, thank you, one person here. All right, liar. Anyways, uh, <laughs> you, you get, you know, so then I'd be like, depressed, I gotta go to school, you know, and then you go to school and they pass out homework, and you're like, Oh, homework, you know, and then I come home and my mom's like, you better go out and feed the cows, you know, and I'm like, shut up, you know, and I'd feed the cows again and we'd milk the cows and then you'd come in and uh, my mom's like, do your homework, I'm like, oh, homework, you know, and then they're like, okay, go to bed, I'm like, for what, to do the same boring, depressing thing, and I remember just, you know, year after year, just every morning I'd wake up and my heart would sink, okay? And then I went off to college. God called me to be a pastor. I, I got saved at the age of 15, and the age of 16, I felt God's call to ministry. So I went to Bible college, and I get there, and I went out for cross country. You know, what, what a stupid sport, you know? <laughs> Who invented this sport? Let's, let's run out in the woods with no spectators for a half an hour in total pain. <laughs> you know, it's like, Wow. So I went up for cross country. So I had a coach, like, we're going to get up and run 10 miles before breakfast. And I'd wake up, oh, oh, oh got to run, you know. And then, oh, class, you know, and then homework. And then I graduated, you know. And, and then I had to feed the sheep, you know, and you became a pastor. Oh, I got to feed sheep. I got to get a sermon ready. And I remember just, you know, going through life depressed, as a pastor, and you know, people would call you up, Pastor, I don't like you, you know, and, and uh, you did this wrong, and you go to deacon's meetings, and you did this wrong, and I'm like, oh, and I'd wake up, oh, deacon's meeting tonight, oh, business meeting, oh, Greek verbs, you know, oh, you know, and, and I was just always down, and, and here I was in my mid-30s, pastor, and I'd wake up, and I'm like, one day I just said, God, I hate my life. I know you called me to be a pastor, but I was just, you know what my greatest thing was that, that gave me joy is I'm going to die someday and go to heaven. Woo! You know, get away from all this pastoral burdens. And, and I, I thought, man, that's not a very good testimony for what Jesus ought to be doing in my life. Amen? And I remember when uh, this one lady in our neighborhood turned 30, she was not a believer. And she said, uh, she said to me, you know, she had a turning 30 party, and she wasn't very happy about it. And she goes, she said to me, I was 35, about, about that age. She goes, how did you handle turning 30? I'm like, man, I was so happy. She goes, why? I said, I'm closer to death, you know. <laughs> and she was like, whoa, you know. And then I'm kind of like, you want to come to church, you know, and <laughs> meet my Savior? And, I, and I'm like, God, I'm not a very good testimony, and I, I said, something is wrong with me. Every day I wake up now, I know I'm going to heaven, and I, I know Jesus saved me, but I'm not, I'm not enjoying my life. And I started praying that, you know, sometimes I think we're a little simplistic in our thinking, a little naive, and I'm like, you know, dear God, please make me happy. You know, did you ever try those prayers? I, I guess I was expecting something from heaven, like, <laughs> Thank you, God. The Holy Spirit just zapped me full of happiness, you know. And that, I, I, that's what I was waiting for. And maybe some of you are like, yeah, I've been praying that God make me happy. Or let me get married, you know, something that would make me happy. Let me tell you what, that's a lot of work too. So don't put your hope in that. So I said, God, please help me. And uh, so one, one, uh, what I was doing during that time is, I said, you know, I want to do a study on the difference between the Holy Spirit and the human spirit in the scriptures. I thought, you know, I, sometimes you read something and you're like, is that talking about the human spirit or the Holy Spirit? So I hunkered down to do the study, and little did I know that God was answering my prayers about delivering me from depression. Okay? Now, I'm not, I want to say something right off the bat. Some of you are going to say, nope, nothing can help me, all right? Well, I think if you're born again, okay, I think you have a chance at least of letting God change your life, okay? 
So this may not help everybody, but I'll tell you what, this saved my life in a, in a tremendous way that I could minister in a better way. So anyways, I want you to take your Bibles during the chapter 15 of, of Proverbs, and I want us to read verse 13. I want to speak this morning on how to heal a broken spirit, okay? Now, you're not going to find a lot of times the word depressed in the scriptures, but um, I believe that what the Bible uses some different vernacular to, to point out what we would call depression a day is what the Bible in Proverbs calls a broken spirit. So how to heal a broken spirit? Let's look at verse 13, first of all. And what we're going to first of all is look at where does a broken spirit come from? Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. Amen? Yes. If you're happy, you got a cheerful countenance, you know. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Can I tell you, some of you, your lives have been filled with nothing but disappointment. And, and uh, you know, or abuse, or you could name a hundred things, but when sorrow constantly comes into your life, there's a point where your spirit will be broken, okay? That, that spirit of man, you know, uh, you know a, a joyful heart makes a, uh, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Well, as I sat and meditated on this verse for a couple days, I said, God, what was the sorrow of my heart that broke my spirit? Now, I want to give a disclaimer right now, and that is, I love my father very much, my earthly father. He's 91 years old, okay? And uh, he's strong as a bull. He's serving the Lord. Uh, you know, he's like the top dude in his church. You know, uh, he does everything. He mows six acres of lawn there and loves God. But I'll tell you, when he was young and the farm wasn't going very well, there was a lot of pressure on him. And uh, one of the pressures is we got to get a lot of work done. And so he takes this eight-year-old. When I'm eight years old, he's like, okay, you're old enough to drive a tractor. I'm talking about not a lawn tractor. I'm talking about a big tractor. So he's like, come on, get out there on, the, on that tractor. I'm like, okay. you know. And he's like, back it up. I'm like, okay. you know. And, and he's like, it's crooked. What's wrong with you? Don't you have a brain in your head? And I'm like, eh. all of a sudden, I'm this eight-year-old kid. I'm petrified of my father. And he's screaming at me, get off that tractor. I'll show you how to back it up, you know. And he backs up. That's how you back up a tractor. I'm like, okay, you know. And now go out there and rake the field. Now you take, he says, you take, you see the way your rake is, is at a 45-degree angle? I'm like, well, I don't know what 45-degree angles mean. He's like, you, you go out there and you take the first windrow and you rake it on top of the second windrow. Then you turn the tractor around and rake the second windrow on top of the first windrow, then you continue on that way. Do you know what I just said? An eight-year-old kid, I'm like, what's a windrow, you know? You don't know what a windrow is? Yes, I do, I do, I do, you know? Like, I just keep my dad happy. Well, I didn't know what it was. He said, if you don't do that, you'll put the first windrow out into the other field. So I go out there, and I start raking, and I'm noticing the first windrow is going out into the other field. And I'm like, I'm not supposed to do this, but I have no idea what he told me to do, and... Finally, you know, after my, my dad comes down with a baler and he's at the other end of the field, like, I'm like, I think I'm in trouble. I get there, he goes, where's the first windrow in the other field? What did I tell you? Not to put it in the other field, you know. Are you just plain stupid? Don't you have a brain in your head? And every time I walked out in the barn to work with my dad, I was a stupid idiot. Now, I love my dad. I forgive my dad, okay? This is something God wanted me to go through. And I, I, I always wanted to please my dad, but never could do it. Drag the field incorrectly. Rake the field incorrectly. I mean, you know, I remember one time the cows got out. He says, all right, I'm going to chase the cows towards you. And when they come, this is a, a, a milking herd of 35 milk cows, Okay. He says, I'm going to chase them towards you. When they get there, make them go into the, you know, into the barnyard through the gate. You know, so I'm like, okay, so these cows know to make a 90-degree turn into the, so all of a sudden, here come 35 stampeding milk cows, and I'm, I'm 10 years old now. And I'm kind of like, you know. You know. And they get closer. Have you ever seen cows run? They put their tails in the air, and they're like, ah. 
<laughs> you know. And they're like, we're free and we're not going in, you know. But here I'm like, please, please, turn, turn. And finally I just run out of the way and they run past me, you know. And my dad's like, what are you doing? I said, they were going to run over me. He says, no, they wouldn't. They're afraid of you. I was like, they didn't look afraid to me, you know. And, oh, you're so stupid. Now i got to round them up again and bring them back. And you never do. I could never do anything right. My dad always loved the clean barn. One time I, I spent all afternoon after school cleaning the barn. I'm like, I'm going to please my dad. He gets home from, he had another job also besides the farm, and he comes home, and I'm like, Dad, come out in the barn. Come here. And I showed him. It looked just like he wanted it to look, and, and he's not saying anything. He's looking, and I show him the barn floor and the milking stable. And, and uh, so, you know, finally he just starts walking out of the barn. I'm like, Dad, I said, well, what do you think? He turns around, he says, why don't you make it this way every day, you lazy bum? He said, you're just lazy. And I remember at that moment, it was kind of like that was the moment when my spirit broke because I could never please my dad. Now, again, I love my dad very much. We have a super relationship. But back then, it was really hard. And it broke my spirit. The sorrow of my heart was I can't please my dad. In fact, I really couldn't please hardly anybody. Couldn't please my teachers. You know, couldn't please the girls. You know, did you ever hear girls call you ugly? You know, I mean, junior high can really hurt you, mess you up pretty bad too. Sorrow of heart. And I remember those junior high, you know, ugly junior high years and stuff. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I don't know what maybe you've been going through in your life, but maybe you wake up every morning and you're, your heart just sinks every day because you have to face life. That was my life. And I was a pastor in my 30s. And I said, God, you got to change that. So God kind of said, well, you had a father that broke your spirit. Now, secondly, what will a broken spirit do to your everyday life? Okay, number two, what will a broken spirit do to your everyday life? Look at chapter 17 of Proverbs and verse 22. Proverbs 17, verse 22 says, A merry heart does good like medicine. Don't you love to sit around, you know, and just laugh with your friends? Isn't that good medicine? Yeah. Yeah. Woo, all right. Yeah, man, there's nothing like a good old time. It does good like medicine. But a broken spirit dries the bones. Hey, a broken spirit is just the exact opposite. If you don't have a merry heart, you have a broken spirit, it dries the bones. In other words, I always wondered why I had never had any energy in my life. You know, teachers like, here's your homework. I'd be like, oh, oh I got, it. you know. Monday morning after church, you know, I was like, oh, I got to get another sermon ready, <laughs> you know. I got to visit the visitors, you know. Oh, deacons meeting. You know, I never, I, I listen. A broken spirit will sap your energy. And some of you never, you know, have you ever looked forward to writing a paper? Okay, all right. We, we have a couple healthy people here. But I, I remember every paper I ever wrote, I was like, oh, 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 oh I got to write it. Uh, uh. Okay. Chapter 18, verse 14. What does a broken spirit do to us? Chapter 18 of Proverbs, or verse 14. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness or in his infirmities. That means his weaknesses. But who can, who can bear a broken spirit? That means if you have a broken spirit, you can't bear up under pressure. And, and so not only does it sap you of your energy, so there's no motivation, but also when the pressure comes, you usually quit. You get overwhelmed by it. You can't bear up because you have a broken spirit. There's nothing there to fight with, okay? Now, I think back to cross country, you know, okay? Let's go run. In college, we, we'd run five-mile races, you know, and we'd practice somewhere between eight and uh, 15 miles a day, you know, practice, and, you know, it just hurts. And now, I had a broken spirit, so the race would start, and I'd start running, and and, uh, you know, I, I'd hear people coming in back of me, and I'm like, oh, no, competition. You know, like, come around, you know, just, you know, God bless you. <laughs> and my coaches, don't let the next two guys pass you or we lose. I'm like, I guess we lose because I, 
you know. Or go catch the next two guys. I'm like, you think I'm going to go up and get those guys, you know? Now, I had guys on my team that were like, ah, let's run. I'm like, oh, I just hope the bus doesn't show up with the other team, you know? We could forfeit, yeah, you know, and I won't have to run. Listen, that's how some of you face life. That's how I was facing my, my, my pastorate. You know, I wasn't ready to go out and win the world to Jesus Christ. I was just trying to exist from day to day without being sad and depressed, okay? I couldn't bear up under pressure. And that's why when I would go to deacon's meetings, I'm like, oh, I wonder what they're going to say I did wrong this time. You know, and they'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I won't do it again. I'm telling you what, I was a mess. I was not a leader. And we need... You know, we need people that can lead. Amen? Well, listen, that's, that's number two. What does a broken spirit do to you? Number three, how important is it to have a strong spirit? Do you think that's important in life? Amen? Let's look at 14, uh, chapter 18, verse 14 again, the first part. The spirit of a man will sustain him in his sickness or his weakness or his infirmity. Okay? The spirit of a man will sustain him in his weakness. Listen, you may have a weakness, a physical weakness, a mental weakness, whatever, but if you have a strong spirit, you can get through it. This one guy I ran cross country with, he, he was nuts. So competitive. One time we were running, he was like, I bet you I can hold that electric fence longer than any of you guys. <laughs> now, growing up on a dairy farm, I'm like, yes, because I'm not touching it, you know. I know what electric fence is, and, he, and he's like, come on. Finally, he got some other idiot to, and they face each other, grab this electric fence, and the other guy collapses, and he's like, I won, you know. I'm like, he's crazy. This guy could run a 416 mile. He was one of the, he, he, he popped his Achilles tendon two weeks before the, the national, you know, race, uh, and, and uh, he waited for two weeks most people are like, well, that's the end of my season, not him. He, he was in 10th place in the nation, the NAIA uh, competition of cross country. He was in 10th place until it popped again, and he limped to the finish line 25th in the nation. And anybody else would have been like, I'm done. It hurts, not him. He was crazy. I actually named my first son after him. I used to pray, God, make my son like him and not like me, and I named him Chris. Chris was an unbelievable guy, very competitive. Now, when Chris went, he, he got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and then he applied at Ohio State for a doctorate. They gave him a test. They said, we don't think you can do the work because you have a severe learning disability. And he's like, yeah, but I have straight A's in all my other classes. Like, we don't know how you did that unless maybe the, you know, they let you off the hook. They, it was an easy school or something. He goes... No, I tell you, he had the most competitive spirit. Do you know what? They said, okay, we'll put you on probation. This guy took a two-year doctorate course and, and graduated with, with straight A's because he had a spirit. He was, like, he was always like, I'm going to get an A. I remember when we took Greek together, you know, and I'd be like, I don't get it. It's like Greek to me, you know, and... and uh, I'm like, come on, let's all just go to bed and we'll just live on the curve, you know. And, and uh, no, Chris, he stayed up all night. We wake, we wake up, his hair is disheveled all over, his eyes are bloodshot, and he's like, I got it. <laughs> I understand it now. I'm like, oh, no, there goes the curve, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you, we need young people today that serve the Lord with a strong spirit. Amen. I'll tell you what, we need some people to stand up to this world and say, nothing's going to take me down because I'm born again. I know the, the truth to life, and I want to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world, and, and I, want to, I want to have a family. I'm going to work through all the problems of, of raising a great family. I'll tell you what, we need people with a strong spirit that are not going to give up, not going to be plowed under, that have, you know, their bones aren't dried up, and they can bear up under pressure. Amen? Amen. That's what we need today. Somebody can get through all these courses that you're taking right now. Instead of giving up, I'm like, well, I just, I, I think I'll do something else. You know, man, we need to be tough. Is it important to have a strong spirit? Yes. The spirit of man will sustain him in his weakness. 
I also remember one time I, I got done preaching at this one church, and this lady comes zipping up the, the, the aisle in a wheelchair, and she goes, she goes, hey, pastor. She goes, man, I want to tell you about my life. She says, I, you know, I got this disease, and I'm being crippled. But, man, I got this great testimony of how the Lord, I'm like, you should not be happy, you know. And sometimes we go, oh, people with handicaps, all oh, this. So listen, if you, have a, if you have a strong spirit, it doesn't matter. You can overcome those weaknesses, those infirmities, those sicknesses. Amen? And that's why we need a strong spirit. So here's the last and the most important part. How do we heal a broken spirit? How do we heal a broken spirit? Well, I want you to, first of all, turn to Proverbs 16.32. Okay, let's stay right here in Proverbs Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32 it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Whoa. Did that, did that hit you? Okay. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Man, if you can control your anger, you're better than a person who could conquer a city. You know, so back in the old days when this was written, they, they used to put cities under siege. These armies would come, and, and the general would have to figure out a, some way how to, you know, so they'd put the city under siege. It might take two years. It might take three years. But, you know, and it says, listen, if you're the kind of person that can control your anger, you're better than that, a general that could come up with a way to conquer a city. Last part of that verse. And he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. Okay, now everybody look up here. Is this the word of God? Is it true? Is it reliable? Can we believe it? Yeah. Amen. And God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to my heart. And he says, listen, I'm talking about, if, I'm, if I have a verse in the Bible that talks about he who rules his spirit, then it must be possible. Amen? Amen? Can you rule your spirit? No, I had a father who was mean to me in junior high. And I, you know, you know I'm an American. I'm a victim. <laughs> you know, it's everybody else's fault. And my mother body drained me wrong, you know. And I, it just, I just can't, you know. Hey, we, want, we got all the psychobabble stuff going on and, Excuses, we're all victims. Stop it. If listen, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is in you. Amen. He gives you power to make choices that the Word of God says. And I start saying, Hey, I can rule my spirit. So I get up in the morning and my, I'm like, Oh no, I got stop it. I'd sit on the edge of my bed and I, I'd tell you, I'd work this out every day. I'm like, By the grace of God, I'm going to get through this day with joy. Amen. <laughs> Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, like living, you know. <laughs> Amen? I got a deacon's meeting tonight. By the grace of God, I'm going to be a leader. I'm not going to let them steamroll me. Amen? Nice to have, was taking seminary courses. I'm like, this one seminary prof's like, you got to write a 40-page paper. I'm like, ah, stop it. <laughs> By the grace of God, I'm going to write this paper, and I'm going to write it being happy. Amen? I'm going to rule my spirit. And I had a lot of excuses, but he said, this guy was like, no late papers. I actually had to go and speak at a camp that, that, that whole week. I'm supposed to get this paper in. 40 pages at the end of the week. I'm like, I'm going to be camp. How can I do it? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. I threw my word processor into the trunk of my car, took it to camp, and I typed out 40 pages. And I, every time I felt like I, was, I ruled my spirit. Amen? You're like, oh. <laughs> One more, Colossians. Keep your finger in Proverbs, but I want you to go to Colossians real quickly. Colossians chapter 3. And when we read this, you might be like, what in the world does this have to do with your message? But I'll explain. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children. That means or irritate them. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And in the Greek, that word discouraged is without spirit or without soul. If 
Fathers, do not irritate your children lest they be without spirit, without soul. And I read that, I'm like, that's what my father did, my earthly father. He irritated me, he provoked me. Every time I worked with him, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. You'll never amount to anything. I don't even know why I asked you to come out here and work with me because you're no good. And, you, and I'm like, yeah, my father, he provoked me and he's discouraged me. And I've been stuck this way for years and years. And I said, okay, who's your daddy now? Who's your father now? Amen? Who is our father, everybody? God. What kind of father is he? Perfect father. Does a perfect father, listen, if the perfect father writes to earthly fathers how to behave, then what would God never do? He would never provoke us. He would never irritate us. Oh, Lord, you gave me a church that's too hard. Oh, God, you gave me a face that I have to look at every morning. How can I overcome this? Oh, God, you gave me a, a spouse that's, Hard to live with. Oh, buck up. Amen? Oh, God, you... you. Hey, listen. I knew, by the, I knew that God had led me to that church to be its pastor. And I said, so God, everything that happens in this church is not a provocation because you don't provoke your children and you don't discourage your children. Now, my earthly dad broke my spirit. Now, he didn't mean to, okay? All right? That's just the way my dad was. And I'm a very tender-hearted person. And I, you know, some people, when you, you, you jump on them, like, you're stupid. They're like, yeah, I'll show you. I'm, I'm not that way. I'm like, okay. You know, <laughs> you know, the deacons get on me. All right. I'm, you know, anybody, I, I'm not, I'll tell you what, I had to change my spirit. I had to change my attitude. And I start saying, God, you're not going to provoke me. In fact, I, you know, now listen. Sometimes faith comes from pure logic, from the scriptures. Amen? Okay, are you tracking with me? And I said, okay, so if God inherited me in salvation as a broken person, a, bro a person broken in spirit, then what do you think his goal is in sanctification of my life? It's to break me more or to, or to repair me and to build my spirit. And by the Spirit of God and His Word, I said, God, you're a perfect Father. You're probably every day trying to lift me up. The Lord lifts up all those that are bowed down over and over in the Scriptures. And he said, Ken Rudolph, I've been trying to help you for years. You just never saw it. You've just been looking at it like, oh, God, make me happy. Zap. No, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Amen? And so God said, listen, Every day, I'm doing something to bring you into a strong spirit. I'm repairing your spirit every day. So this is my, every day I'd get up and I'd take those two verses, Proverbs 16, 32, and Colossians 3, 21, and I'd sit on the edge of my bed. I'm like, you know, okay, all right. There's nothing that, by the grace of God, I can't get through today. I'm going to rule my spirit. I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to choose peace. I'm going to choose love. And then I said, and God, I wonder what you, as a perfect father, I wonder what you're going to do today to build my spirit, to encourage me, because I'm so broken. I need to be healed. Woo, I can't wait to see what you're going to do today. And I started healing. And it took a couple years. Every day I had to meditate on those things and meditate and meditate. I got so, I would come home. Now, my wife used to always be like, you know, oh, I... You know, I'd, I'd always, oh, the pastor it so hard, and blah, 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 blah. She said, oh, I just wish you liked your job. And I started coming home. I remember one time I had a terrible day, but I conquered it through the power of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit and God's Word, and I got through some really difficult situations. And I came home, my wife said, how was your day today? And I said, man, I love my job. And my wife's like, a happy husband, a happy husband. Hey, listen. Being saved is more than just going to heaven. Amen? As long as God gives you life on earth, he says, I want you to be a testimony of the grace of Jesus Christ, not only to save you from your sin, but to continue to save you from your sin. To those of us who are being saved, 
and have a testimony of that. We love life, amen? Doesn't matter who's president, amen? Doesn't matter what's going on in the world, amen? But we can have a spirit of let's take the gospel to the world. Oh, but the Muslims are taking over. Oh, yeah? Just wait. Because I have the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to all the world and preach it to every creature. Amen? Amen. So let me go back to Proverbs real quickly, verse chapter 15 again, and then we'll be done. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. It says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Can I tell you what? All the words from my father in those early years that broke my spirit, those perverse words, you're worthless, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're not worth anything. You know what? And all the girls in junior high school that called me ugly, you know, those things hurt. And those, the perverseness in a tongue breaks a spirit, but... That first part, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. We have the wholesome tongue of our God. Amen? Amen. He speaks to us every day. He speaks to us every day. And he's like, I love you. I love you, Ken. I'm going to repair you. I'm a good father. I would never discourage you. So I don't know where you are today. Maybe some of you are like, oh, I can't use that message at all. I have a strong spirit. Praise God. Keep going. But maybe some of you need to be repaired. Take the wholesome tongue of our perfect Father and let it heal you. Go forward. We need to be people who love life and are ready to conquer the world for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that by your Spirit you would take some of the hearts that are broken, some of the spirits out here represented today sitting in these seats, are people with broken spirits, people that have no hope for the future, people that are, 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 are downtrodden because of their past or, or because of their broken spirit, whatever it is, Father, I pray, Lord, if you're a perfect Father, then you would never violate your own word, which says a good Father does not irritate his children and break their spirit. And so, Father, I, I believe that, that because of who you are, that you are constantly speaking to us these kind words, encouraging us, building us up so that we can go out and encourage a world that we have a Savior who can take away their sins, a Savior who can solve the problems of this world, a Savior who gave us life out of love and, and out of kindness and, and connected us to a Father, that we are joint heirs with Christ, and therefore you are our Father, and you want us to, to go out and show the world that life is wonderful and that we love to live it. We will not take our lives because life is hard. We will give you our lives because it is livable and it is joyful and it is wonderful in Jesus Christ. Pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would sweep into our lives, into our minds, and speak these kind words and become a tree of life for us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.